I'm Alan Kohler, founder of Eureka Report, which is now part of Intelligent Investor, finance presenter on ABC News and a columnist for The New Daily. And I'm Stephen Main, contributor at Intelligent Investor, founder of Crikey, shareholder, activist and retiring City of Manningham councillor. And we are... Back in the cafe. Money Cafe. The Money Cafe. Beautiful sunny so, day in uh, Melbourne. It's good to be back. It's good to see you again, Stephen. It's been a while, Alan. Yes. I've missed you. So if you're still... A, a Manningham councillor? Counting down the days, October 26. So uh, so all the ballot papers, all the voting well, packs I, got voted out, Stephen, sent out this week. If I lived in Manningham, I would move out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, you know, the place is going to go to rack and ruin without you now. <laughs> I'm actually um, emceeing tonight a uh, Lord Merrill candidates debate. So uh, for the South Bank Residents Association, so that'll be a bit of fun. Right. That's City of Melbourne contest is a it'll be a close one. So that's going to be. Oh, there's uh, lo- one there's to watch. more more candidates than I uh, than I imagined there'd be. Well, the Liberal and Labor are, are, Apparently, don't usually run. So well, Gary Morgan's a candidate. Well, he's been five in a row. I mean, he's sort of a bit of a joke. I mean, he's a mate of mine, but uh, Gary's Gary won't win. But his preferences can occasionally get a councillor up or help a. Help a Lord Mayoral candidate. Who's going to so win? Who do you think is going to win? Well, I think it'll be Nick Reese or Aaron Wood. Um, and I need to be Switzerland ahead of tonight, so I'm not going to say anything. But I think it's a good contest and uh, looking forward to listening to the debate. Yeah. Well, that'll be good. Now, what about the, uh, I guess, the news of the day? Rio Tinto, just a lazy $10 billion cash bid to get into the uh, lithium space. That's a bit of a dramatic move. Certainly is. Um, it's interesting because uh, BHP has decided not to buy any lithium businesses. They're interested in battery minerals, but only in nickel and copper, uh, and particularly copper. So they've gone all in on copper. Rio's going all in, more or less, all in on lithium. And I think it's interesting. I mean, Arcadium is the company that came out of uh, was a merger of Oricobra and Galaxy originally. Yep. And then last last year, last May, it was the the resulting business called Alchem was merged with a, um, a processing business in the US called Livevent, which um, turned it into a, a miner and processor of lithium. And yeah, vertically um, integrated global vertically. lithium player. Yeah. Listed in New York, board meetings in Ireland for tax reasons, so one major mine in, in operation in WA. Which they're closing. Which they're closing and got, got, got smashed by the lithium wipeout and Rio Tinto have opportunistically come along and said... Uh, Diamonds in the rubble, but you know, ten yeah, billion—it's quite an expensive. Uh, well, and diamond. they're paying ton, a lot more than it was trading at. Well, double. I mean, it's not often you see a takeover at double the price. No, but like they're right. they're overpaying. They're being ill-disciplined. They could have got it for six or seven, and no, they're no, paying ten. Uh, no, no. Our friend James Thompson says it, it, it's a bargain because he was quoting a um, analyst, I think an analyst from City, saying that the uh, replacement value of Arcadium's assets is eight billion dollars. US, so that's so they've got it for six point seven billion US. So it's on a replacement cost basis, it's a bargain. So, Alan, I want to take you back to Grand Final Eve for two thousand and seven. The shareholder meeting to approve oh, I Rio, it well, T- Rio Tinto's forty four billion cash takeover of Alcan. I stood up, was the only person who spoke against it, voted my three shares against it, and they lost probably twenty billion dollars. So big miners with lots of cash from iron ore and stuff have a history of going over the top and 10 billion cash for something trading at five. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. You never offer double. It's just ill-disciplined. Oh, well, there you go. So, um, but look, it, it brings... He's, ta- he's taking a long-term view, Stephen. Yeah, look, you know, I'm, I'm not going to afford it, but I mean, after that takeover, Rio Tinto had to do an emergency 15 billion US dollar rights issue and almost fell into the control of China with um, Chinalco. So, look, that was a disaster when Rio Tinto last... I mean, I agree this is smaller. It's not 44 billion US dollars, but it does continue the takeover deluge. We've had 27 takeovers of more than 200 million dollars complete so far on the ASX this year as it thins out and uh, this is the biggest of the lot at 10 billion cash although it's not really an Australian company it's more a global secondary listing here but uh, I mean it is one less uh, fee paying client for the ASX and all those shareholders in the old companies um, or a Cobre etc they who rolled into this vehicle you know they get tens of thousands of them they will get compulsorily taken out for cash uh, because it's a scheme of arrangement deal, and so 
if uh, the shareholders vote in favour of what the board's saying, uh, see you later. Another one bites the dust. Indeed. There you go. Um, uh, just on another matter, um, what's going on with the Murdoch family in Reno? Where are they up to now? They're just waiting on the judge's opinion, a uh, judge's judgment. Yeah, about but it's the most sort of secretive, you know, so court it was all case in, ever. It, it was in camera, right? That, yeah, the whole it, thing's in camera. All, all you saw was the... The, the, the five parties and wives and husbands walking in and out of court and uh, <laughs> no idea what's happening inside. So, uh, yeah, but uh, it's uh, it's obviously very um, uh, important in terms of uh, global power and democracies as to whether the right-wing model, Fox News, etc., stays long-term post-Rupert. So, look, it's a consequential fight, but it's ridiculously secretive. I must say I, th- I do think that if... Um uh, if the siblings, James, Elizabeth and Prudence, win and, um, you know, the trust stays as it is and they get control once Rupert dies uh, and they change Fox News into a more a, a centre, non, non-right-wing, more of a centre sort of network, someone else will come along and take its place on the right wing because, yeah. because right. it's lucrative, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing. It makes tonnes of money. So, you know... I just I think that if we think that the Reno Nevada court case is going to save the world from Fox News, I think we're kidding ourselves. I think it's more likely that the moderate kids would just sell it, just sell Fox News to the Republican Party or some other Elon Musk or you know because if you're embarrassed from a family legacy point of view for you know pushing right wing propaganda, de- denying climate and uh, prom- making Donald Trump. Um, then you just sell something that's toxic. You don't change it to CNN light. You just no, sell okay. it. So I think no, that's – when enough. Rupert goes, I think there's a, there's a breakup of the empire. And I actually raised that yesterday at the REA AGM in Melbourne. It was, it was a virtual AGM. You know, what does this Murdoch family fight meet, mean for us at REA? Yeah, what you know, they it say? Tw- 20, 29 billion. And why has Rupert Lachlan or no Murdoch ever served on this board? You know, this is a magnificent success story and no Murdoch's ever been on the board. Well, of course, Hamish McLennan said, I couldn't possibly comment on a private family matter. Um, <laughs> and News Corp is a magnificently supportive shareholder and we appreciate that. And we continue to go from strength to strength uh, despite running a completely needless virtual AGM yesterday where they, they had the normal AGM set up. You could see the stage and all the people lined up at the Richmond head, head office. But this year they just banned physical attendance. So it's like, would they, would they have an auction where you can't turn up and inspect the property, you know, take the real estate play out of the AGM? But uh, so very disappointing that they, uh, they did that. But uh, still, uh, what, a, what an amazing success story it is, even though it was denied the chance to pay $12 billion to buy. Do you think they'd sell, they'd get out of REA as well? Well, I think it's the... Why does Rupert dies? Yeah, because Rupert, the, the, you know, Rupert's more interested in power and political influence and traditional journalism. And this is the largest part of his empire that's left that's not journalism or influence. It's just a straight, boring business. And so he sold all of the entertainment assets, you know, which was, you know, anything which is not powerful, you know, making films and stuff, I'm out of it because I'm at, the, at my core, I'm a journalist influencer. So if it's all about the influence, why do you own REA? There's, there's, no, there's nothing... nothing. We're talking about once once Rupert dies, right? Yeah. Assuming he does die eventually. Well, he he will, Alan, I I guess. But I think he's got at least another five years. And so this this whole Murdoch family fight could be something about nothing for another ten years if he lives like his mother and cracks a hundred. The other thing that's been going... Oh, speaking of, look, speaking of AGMs, you've been attending a few, haven't you? Oh, well, it's really just starting to warm up. At the moment. So we've got a horizon this afternoon, which I'll be going to, as I mentioned, uh, REA yesterday. But uh, in terms of like interesting scandals, I think November 22, the Wise Tech annual meeting with uh, the billionaire Richard White splashed all over the papers at the moment with his uh, business disputes with his lover, his ex lover, and the court battles. And so this is going to be uh, a I lot of. I didn't read the story. There was something about him. He bought a $13 million mansion in Vaucluse for his secret lover 
and she spent 90 grand on furniture fitting it out and then his girlfriend found out about it and terminated the relationship and she sued him and Garner sheared from his account 90 grand to get the furniture back and then he filed a bankruptcy clause and now they're duking it out with lawyers and PR people and press coverage everywhere and that's very, very untidy. Very untidy. <laughs> And I'll give you an but example. They, but, but they weren't married. Their girlfriend, this, yeah, yeah. his girlfriend, but not I, I, wife. This, so it's, it's an interesting point. How do you raise a sex scandal at an AGM? Okay, so at last year's AGM, I asked this written question at the WiseTech AGM. Quote, on July 16 this year, the AFR's rear window columnist, Joe Aston wrote a rather spicy piece about our chair and controlling shareholder Richard White, suggesting his billionaire status was leading him to be distracted from running our company. Could Richard please provide a pr- response as to whether he thought the criticisms were fair or unfair? So that's how you, you know, because you can't say, you know, did you do this? You see, you've got to just frame it generally. And the chair didn't let Richard speak and the chair refuted the outrageous articles, you know, blah, 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 blah. And the other example I'll give you is when the reports came out about Rupert uh, and Wendy Deng's marriage ending because Wendy had had an affair with Tony Blair. So the question was, how do I bring that up at an AGM? So I went to LA and I said, Chairman, there's been a lot of press coverage about some sort of uh, falling out with Tony Blair, who's been a long been a great friend of the company. What happened? And Rupert paused and just said, Look, uh, Mr. Blair's never been on the payroll. And I think I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so, uh, yes. That's funny. So, uh, oh, well, I'll, I'll look forward to your uh, how you frame the question at this year's yes. Wise Tech AGM about Richard White's untidy behaviour. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've got. I wouldn't be surprised if he retires from the book. Like, it's just all a bit messy. Um, so, look, we'll see. So Just before we go into questions, we've got uh, China's stimulus w- worth mentioning because uh, last week um, the People's Bank of China cut interest rates and there's was there was uh, some other monetary policy things which were a bit underwhelming, nothing much, uh, nothing much in that. I did an interview with Jared Berg, who was the NAB's China expert, and he was kind of saying that... Uh, it was underwhelming, and then they, they, everyone was waiting for a Tuesday afternoon announce, fiscal policy announcement, which was supposed to be the bazooka, which wasn't. That came out Tuesday afternoon, uh, and it was basically a pop gun of uh, fiscal measures. Now there's going to be another measure on Saturday that will be announced, and everyone's saying, well, you know, this will be the, this will be the bazooka. Um, but, uh, but really, just keep an eye on it, everyone, because if it's anything less than three trillion US worth of fiscal stimulus directed towards consumers will be taken as disappointing by the markets. Um, if it's five trillion or more, then that'll be a bit of a, a bit of a kick for the markets. Um, but less than three trillion will be disappointing. Um, and then the question is, you know, will this make any difference to the Chinese economy long term or will it result in uh, improvements in the iron ore price, etc., and um, the answer is probably not, unless it's something serious like ten trillion US dollars. The markets are certainly anticipating serious. I mean, we've seen some solid moves in some of the big commodity prices. Xi Jinping has not been inclined to do that sort of thing. I mean. Um, the lesson out of it, to some extent, the analogy is with Japan during the 90s when, um, you know, they came out with, you know, measure after measure, fiscal measure after fiscal measure, but they were all too small. Nothing was really big. Mm. Um, but when in, in the GFC, um, the US government and the Australian government, um, the US government's stimulus package after the GST was 10% of GDP. Wow. Um, you know, really serious I mean, all of China's, all of Japan's measures were like 1% or 2% of GDP. Um, so I was far, amused to see the Reserve Bank admitting that they went over the top during COVID and giving the banks $188 billion of printed money as three-year loans at 0.1% was perhaps a little bit more than the system required at the time. Yes. So, um, yeah. So, well, anyway, we'll see, we'll see if they... If they deal with it uh, in a material way. I suspect that they probably will come up with something big on Saturday, but look, you know. 
And the other, and the only other thing we should probably cover off is Iran and Israel, or at least Israel. I mean, so far Israel hasn't attacked Iran. The the question uh, really is whether Israel tries to or does take out Iran's oil exporting capacity with the idea of destroying its economy. And uh, it remains possible. I mean, there's still talk that it'll, that's, that's what they'll do. It, it wouldn't be too hard either because 90% of Iran's oil exporting comes from a single island, island yeah, that's right. off so. uh, Iran's coast called Karg Island. Mm. Um, so it wouldn't be too hard, I imagine, to blow that up. I don't think they'll do that, though, because that will just annoy the whole world when everyone's paying more at the Bowser for petrol and the Americans are specifically saying don't do that. Although I just noticed this morning that the, apparently the Israelis are not sharing the detail of their precise plans with the Americans, which is well, a they're, bit, Well, they're not listening to America at all. They're do, you know, yes. Biden's uh, been completely run rings around by Netanyahu, yes. as, the, as they keep saying. Yes. Oh, well, we'll see what happens. Uh, before we move on to the questions, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Can ethical investing outperform traditional strategies? Join Nathan Bell, Portfolio Manager of the Intelligent Investor Ethical Share Fund, for an exclusive webinar where he'll share five compelling reasons why ethical investing might enhance your returns. Discover how ethically screened companies can unlock growth potential and explore the latest international stocks added to the fund. Register now to join the live session on Tuesday, the 15th of October at 1pm or sign up to receive the recording later. Visit offer.intelligentinvestor.com.au forward slash I-N-E-S. Now, Alan, 15 questions this week, but only two from female listeners which we would like to have a lot more of. So we're starting with Trudy. Loves the podcasts and you've lifted my basic economic knowledge to a new level. With the rise of Trump and after watching the debate with Kamala, I'm perplexed by something. Why do right-wing politicians espouse the idea that the country will be richer and better off financially without immigrants? Surely basic economics confirms that if immigration contributes significantly to the improving GDP. Why is this a line that has continued to be used and believed by these supporters? What am I missing? Well, you're missing uh, you're missing the ignorance, Trudy. Yes, uh, that's right. There's no doubt Racism, about it. Racism, nationalism. It is, there's no doubt about it that immigration improves a, con- uh, a country's uh, prosperity and wealth and GDP, all the rest of it. It's not just that they take jobs; they create demand, which increases jobs. So, uh, and that is absolutely true. And that's, it's not I mean, just the far right. Like I, do, I would make the point that you know Australia's unions have traditionally not wanted to encourage too much migration because they enjoy the fact that we have the highest minimum wage in the world and they don't want to drive down the price of labor and that's that's a national that's a natural self-interest position as well but uh, yeah it is it is disappointing that so many people are running this hard right line and it's getting political traction like never before in my lifetime so uh, it's it's a pretty perplexing um, situation yes. Well, I mean, look, obviously there's, it's not just ignorance. There's a lot of people who are uh, unhappy about the changing nature of their country with lots of immigration, um, changing the colour of people's faces that they see in the streets. So, there's, you know, there's, there's a bit of that going on. We always on. used to say that at the city of Melbourne, we'd always used to say the world's most successful multicultural city. You know, Robert Dawe used to talk about the 220 languages and... Uh, yeah, so there's, there's, there aren't actually that many places like Melbourne and Sydney which are so diverse, so multicultural. No, I mean, there's true. countries like Japan which are just, you know, absolutely monocultural. Very little migration in there, very, very... Very true. One tribe, one race. Tommy says, do annual capital growth rates for Australian property accurately reflect, reflect the value appreciation of the underlying land or are they distorted by neglecting the cost of capital improvements incurred by owners and investors? Have we been in fe- have we been fed overinflated returns all along? So, Tommy, the answer is that um, in 2006, CoreLogic introduced what I called hedonic uh, home pr- house price indexes, which do or are designed to reflect improvements in the value of the housing. Uh, so, uh, be- before 2006, it's true that the house price uh, data from the ABS did- didn't take into account the changes in the value of the housing, but these hedonic indexes that CoreLogic does do, the way they do it is um, that if they learn that in some way the house a house has changed, has improved, they, they can't take into account cosmetic 
renovations, but if the house has increased in size, looked like it's had an upper level extension, more bedrooms, or the size of the land has increased in some way, um, then they take it out of the index on one day and then they put it back the next day with the new value. Okay. So, um, uh, so look, they try to. It's very difficult. It's not. Mm. I, I wouldn't say it's perfect, Tommy. That um, that it, you know. It, perfectly captures the increase in the value of each property yeah. but it, the, but they're having a go at it and, and it does we, do we to try and do extent. it at council as well with rates we 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 know from building and planning permits if someone's you know had a big renovation and I'm so sure we we'll try to put I'm, up the valuation to I'm reflect I'm sure councils do that yes. in order to increase the rates no to get a fair spread of the rates it's a total misnomer that you know issuing new housing permits delivers us extra revenue because we just lower the rate in the dollar so, so it's pre- all about the equal spread of how much you need. You don't make windfall money from brand new. So I presume, Stephen, in two weeks' time when you come off the council, I'll be you'll stop, be, oh, that's you'll, right you'll stop being an apologist. We'll a taxing bunch of bludgers in there. Yes, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But- all councils are a disgrace. <laughs> now, Glenn says, um, actually, speaking of property, we should mention now that your quarterly essay on housing what is it? You've you've made some long list for book of the political book of the year. Is that right? Political that book somewhere? of the year. Political book of the year. Even though long it's an list. economic book. Oh, it's definitely a, it's definitely it's a definitely political <laughs> book. A political, political book. expert, Alan Kohler, has written the political book of the no, year. No, I'm not saying I'm a political political expert, but it is a political book. There's so yes. much politics in it. <laughs> yes, that's right. So you're on the long list of ten for political book of the year. Is, what happens next? Is there a short short list, list next? A short list of three, and then. The winner, which, uh, well, I don't know. Will it be me? That is very Who exciting. Knows? That is very exciting. Well done. Great essay. Glenn. The, uh, I should say that the – oh, no, it doesn't matter. I say it, Alan. Oh, no, the judges are Barry Cassidy, Laura Tingle and someone else. <laughs> it's an, an ABC inside job, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> are you friends with either of them? Absolutely never heard never of them. Never heard of them, yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Oh, Glenn says, I love the show. We've even gone back and listened to all episodes in the archive. Anyone can do that. And if you want to get more Alan, just subscribe to Intelligent Investor and you get endless Alan interviews with CEOs. Uh, by the way, I did, a, uh, I did a p- podcast last week with uh, AMPs, Shane Oliver and Diana Messina. It was an hour long in their office up in Sydney. Wow. And um, it's available on YouTube, Spotify, etc. So that's if you're interested. Uh, look, it was quite an interesting chat with mm. those. If you Very good. Now, Glenn's got a question about uh, compulsory acquisitions, saying that, the, you know, he didn't accept the offer and it's taking too long and, you know, and I, I just, I guess, say that thank God we don't see too many compulsory acquisition processes these days because most takeovers ever since Extrata bought MIM in 2003 and won in the Federal Court or the Queensland Supreme Court to defend that process. The vast majority of takeovers now are schemes of arrangement where it's just automatically they give you the money no matter what if 75% vote in favour and you don't have this annoying compulsory acquisition thing where in the old school takeovers you had to get to 90% and then once you got 90% you could compulsorily acquire the rest and then it is a shocking process. I've got thousands of dollars of unclaimed money sitting out there for compulsory acquisitions where I've never filled in the form properly or whatever. So, Glenn, I hear your pain, but bottom line is just accept the offer if, if it's going to be compulsory because you don't want to get caught up in the… Or better still sell on the market. Sell on the market. Often, sell on the market. I, I often do that. I cop the $5 brokerage and sell on the market to get the to, and pay get a cent less or whatever just to get the money in the bank so I'm not dealing with, sure. you know, takeover issues. Yeah, yeah. Michael says, hi, Alan, this week… You mentioned that new apartments along the metro lines in Sydney are probably starting at a million dollars each, so not really affordable. Agreed. One of the considerations that doesn't get enough media attention uh, is uh, what proportion of a new residential property is due to Commonwealth and state government and local fees and charges. I've heard it's something like 40%. Someone on LinkedIn suggested it can be as high as 50%. It seems to me that all three layers are in ignoring this consideration as these fees and charges pay for the various public services and other election promises. Yes, that's true. It's somewhere between 30 and 40%. Total taxes. This is not just stamp duty. We're talking stamp duty, GST, uh, developer costs and charges for, the, you know, for building it. Uh, uh, I think probably developer company tax. I mean, look, like every, if you add up every single tax... 
that is on a an apartment block. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, I, it I, is I will agree as there much is, as forty percent. There is, look, there is, there is GST. I'll agree with that. In some states, you've got very high development taxes, um, but I'll also just give you the the contrary that in Manningham. The rates are only 0.151%, so you'd have to live 630 years to pay the value of your house in rates. And the only development tax we have is a 5% tax on subdivision tax on the land value. There is no council tax or charge on anything to do with the actual build. The only ta- well, building permit, planning permit, whatever, but they're not, not much. So I disagree I, with this forty percent national I say, average. I am looking forward to you not being a, an apologist for the councils, Stephen. Yeah, all right. I mean, uh, yes, okay. Councils, councils, not the big deal, but but it is definitely a, a tax. I was at a forum recently, and I put it to the Victorian Treasurer Tim Pallas that the level of taxation on new builds of housing and apartments um, is so high that it's the sort of tax you put on something you're trying to discourage. Except you get a stamp duty holiday on some new apartment builds, you know, and many of them are being bought by people with homeowner grants, you know, and this sort of stuff. So anyway, look, I just make the point that I think this tax issue, it it might be at the margins. The biggest problem is the price of land. I'll give you the, in Manningham, two thirds of the total value of all property is the land. The land's 50 and the buildings are 25. If the land fell to 25, that would massively reduce the cost of buying a house. So just get the price of land down. But the problem with that is that it, it will massively smash the wealth of Australians and the solvency of our banks because there would be big defaults and all that sort of stuff. So, but if, if land prices fell, the whole thing would be fixed. Keith says, Hi team, with the rise in popularity of ETFs, should companies like Vanguard be required to give proportional voting rights to investors for companies that are held in their various ASX listed ETFs? Also, can a Vanguard utilise their shareholding in a company for more than one of their ASX listed products simultaneously? And if so, how would this affect the voting on shares? So look, I do want to pick up on something said last week about these big index funds, Vanguard, BlackRock and State Street. Broadly, they do still control the votes of the vast majority of the holdings they have. So it's not practical to give it out, particularly to retail punters, you just can't. And um, so, yes, there are some, there will be a proportion, maybe 10 or 20% where the institutional client will say, State Street, you can manage some of our money, but we want to control the voting rights. But overall, those big three firms, Vanguard, BlackRock and State Street, do control the votes over more than 10% of the average company and they're often bloody hopeless. And I cite you Goodman Group, where they own, between them they own 25% of Goodman Group. And you know why the category is highest for property? Because they sell a lot of property ETFs. So a lot of people buy property ETFs, which means these big index funds have bigger holdings in Goodman and other listed property trusts than any other sector because it's all driven by the branding on the ETF. And they've let Goodman Group get away for years with questionable remuneration structures where share-based payments are not included in um, the operating EPS, which is a bit of a technical thing. But all I'm saying is that they are very powerful and they should use their power more often to rein in dodgy REM schemes like Goodman and you know take on the Murdochs and other issues where yeah, they could be more powerful if they what? chose to use their power. They're not going to. No, because they're too busy making money and running their index scheme to really lean in on governance and voting and activism, these lazy index funds. That's it. Dane says, welcome back from your holiday, Alan. Thank you, Dane. What are your thoughts on a tax distribution reform where the individual's annual tax goes towards paying off their hex debt? Well, look, um, a nice idea, Dane, but (laughs) the government actually wants both of those amounts of money. that They want the hex debt to be paid off and they want to have the tax. They don't want to have one offset the other. Thanks very much. Yes. That is never going to happen. Yes. (laughs) I'd just like to briefly thank uh, Rupert Murdoch for paying some of my hex up front during my three-year cadetship at the Herald and Weekly Times. Thank you, Rupert. Um, Ram says, uh, just voted for the Money Cafe pot of the year. And, uh, well, Ram wants to know about... uh, how we can? Well, what would happen if Victoria did actually default on its bonds, because their debt is so high and it's rising by 400 million a week with no sign of any slowdown? Now, I guess all I'd say is, if there was a default, that would require missing an interest payment or missing a full redemption, a payback of the bonds. 
And this would cause immediate contagion with other bond yields across Australia and the Feds blowing out. The currency would crash and we'd all be downgraded as a nation. And uh, it would be a world-famous global default, first time by an English-speaking government in my lifetime because defaults historically have been, you know, Russia, 72 billion in 1988, Argentina, 82 billion. And last year, the six defaults were Sri Lanka, Ethiopia, Argentina, Mozambique, Cameroon, and El Salvador. So if, if Victoria defaulted, we'd be in the same category as those countries and we'd be a global laughing stock, and therefore it won't happen. Therefore it will not happen. So That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so keep buying Victorian at bonds. Ease. No matter at how ease, reckless Ram. they are, don't worry about it. They will never it's be okay. a default in an English speaking country. It won't country. default. No, it will just won't def- the federal government won't allow it. Yeah, correct. They'll just print money. And uh, they do need some sort of discipline over the states because they are just borrowing with gay abandon and abusing the, the effective government guarantee from the feds. So it's all, all care, no responsibility. That's true. Tom says, let's say I buy a car for 45000 because the salesperson tells me it's discounted. I don't shop around, take their word for it. On the way home, I drive past the dealer two blocks away selling the same car for 35000 Will the ACCC take the salesperson to court on my behalf or am I responsible for my own lack of diligence? Yes, it's the latter, Tom. The <laughs> ACCC is not going to take the, <laughs> the dealer to, to court on your behalf. Um, yeah. You should have uh, checked first. Yes, they're, uh, they're not going to help you, Tom. I'll tell you what, though. Our federal regulators, they're becoming a massive source of revenue for the federal government at the moment. I mean, see yesterday that they're, they're hitting Aussie Super for a $27 million fine for not consolidating accounts uh, when they should have. You know, you look at the $100 million from Qantas, uh, what they're going to get from um, Coles and Woolies, uh, Oztrac, you know, well, massive fines, casino companies. They, they're becoming a profit centre. They don't need a budget allocation, these regulators. Now, they are... They are delivering well, record profits. I hope their CEOs are getting, you know, performance bonuses for making so much money. <laughs> yeah, well, as a taxpayer, I could, all I can say is, great. Let's just no, hope they don't ever come along and find the money cafe. I mean, it seems no one's safe from these regulators at the moment. Go James on. says, I have a question about how a central bank digital currency in Australia would work. Will such a currency have retail customers holding accounts with the RBA? Is this the sort of thing that will be a replacement for cash? My main query is, would the transaction cost to merchants or users with a CBDC be smaller than using credit cards or FBOS? Could yes. these costs even be zero? Well, it's a very interesting question, James. And the thing is, I would say we already have digital currency. I don't know about you, but I haven't had cash in my wallet for a very long time. Uh, so money is already digital. What they're talking about with the central bank digital currency, which the RBA looked into and then gave up. It's not, it's not proceeding with it. But, the, but there are a few central banks in the world still looking at it. No one's uh, done it. I think, well, actually one or two central, small central banks have done it. But really what you're talking about is, as you point out in the question, uh, that the um, it basically involves having retail customers holding accounts with the RBA. That's what it, that's what it basically means, and it's kind of it's kind of a um, a nationalisation of the payment system to some extent by stealth, which uh, the RBA and the Australian government doesn't want to do because the banks r- uh, run Australia and they don't want to be they <laughs> they, they don't want to have their power taken Cartel away. Cartel taken away. No, that's right. So. Um, but there are probably there are some countries where I think the, the central bank is probably prepared to do it. Um, so yeah, that's uh, interesting. Now let's I don't jump, think it's going to happen here. No, I agree. Now let's jump ahead to Lee at question thirteen. It said just some clarification about a couple of lists of questions and your discussion about the ACCC acting its coals and woolies discussed in terms of price gouging. Actually, the ACCC action is not about price price gouging, but rather it is about misleading advertising of prices. I've heard this conflation in a number of public discussions. The ACCC does not regulate supermarket prices, as they say, and this is alleged breaches of consumer law. So, look, James, we'll take this as a comment, Lee, I guess. You are correct that it is not price gouging. So what is price gouging? I think, it's, I think it's price gouging when they're being accused of putting prices up before they discount them. Right? No, but that's misleading. It's not gouging. Like gouging yes, is charging fifteen dollars for a bottle of water at a Taylor Swift concert, where where people can go nowhere else. They have no other option. Okay. You always have the option of going to Audi, Alan. You're not I, forced in I a power would. imbalance, and then you get. It's like after a disaster when there's a massive hurricane comes through, and the local shop quadruples the price of bread. Oh, that right, is okay. 
ga- predatory gouging. All right, okay, whatever you say. <laughs> Thanks, Grandpa. Uh, <laughs> Mitch says, I enjoy listening to Alan's ABC News segments and recent, recently your Money Cafe podcast. Um, and they like the quarterly essay. But on another matter, is it better to invest in a beta shares ETF via my traditional chess sponsored broker or using the beta shares direct platform? My broker charges only a once off brokerage fee, but it seems that the beta shares direct platform charges ongoing monthly fees. What do you think? Well, I think you've answered your own question, Mitch. Co- correct. <laughs> correct. <laughs> I think the old $5 Comsec for a $500 purchase is probably. Uh, Better value, and you, you don't want to have too many platforms that you're dealing with, too many accounts. So, if you can buy everything through the one broker, the one platform, it's probably more efficient to do that. Have all your records in the one place rather than having to log on to the beta shares platform to work out your yeah, tax well, see, I've done fees. That the, I've done that in the past, and I've forgotten about them. Somebody rang me the other, someone said, wrote to me the other day and said, "You've got X dollars in such and such an account." I thought, "Oh Christ, I forgot about that one." Oh, gee, we, <laughs> wasn't much. It no. wasn't much, but you're you know. such a busy man. You can't keep up with all your investments, Alan, can you? A bit like my 400 shareholdings. I've got no idea what's going on. That would drive me mad, oh, Stephen. It does, it I, would, does. Uh, I don't think I'd be able to get to sleep I've at night. I've got so many uh, unsorted administrative issues. Now, let's finish with our second female questioner, Megan. I've recently started listening to the Money Cafe podcast after a recommendation from Oz Finance sub Reddit. Thank you, Reddit. I really enjoy Alan's commentary plus the other contributors. I bought some shares in the aftermath of the GFC and have gradually added to my portfolio over the years, focusing on companies with female CEOs. What a good idea. That's an interesting way to invest, isn't it? I'm wrangling my four-year-old and two-year-old. I don't pay much attention to company performance. However, I realise I shouldn't let my vote at the various AGMs go to waste. How do I go about nominating you or a similar shareholder activist as my proxy? Well, Megan, sadly, I can't it's hard enough asking questions at AGMs as opposed to legally collecting the proxies and then voting them. So don't appoint me. Appoint the Australian Shareholders Association if it's an ASX 200 company and they will collect the proxies. They vote about 4 to $5 billion worth a year. It used to be $8 billion until everything went digital and uh, no paper and the oldies stopped filling in the forms and sending back the reply paid envelopes. And Megan, enjoy the upcoming golden decade of parenting from the ages of four to 14. That's when the kids still love you and they're a lot of fun and then they become annoying teens <laughs> who no longer <laughs> worship you or do as you're told. So look forward to the next 10 years and appoint the ASA as your proxy. That's good. good answer. I agree. Thanks, uh, thanks for listening to today's episode of The Money Cafe. It's been great, as always, with Stephen and I'll be back next week with James Thompson. Uh, so send in a question to the money cafe at eurekareport.com.au and uh, James and I will answer it. Till then, I'm Alan Cola, founder of Eureka Report, etc. I'm Stephen Main, and we'll see you in a fortnight. <laughs>